Um, so as Georgie said, uh, my name is Kerry Porteous and I'm one of the operations managers in the Nature Track office. I'm a bit of a regular on these evenings now, so you may well have come across me before. Um, but this evening I'm talking about one of my favourite places to begin with, Madagascar. Um, I first went to Madagascar back in 2009 um, and after joining Nature Trek, uh, 10 years ago now, I've been lucky enough to go back a couple of times since leading some of our tours. It's a fantastic country. Let's get cracking. So to start off with, um, let's have a look at where Madagascar came from. It is today the fourth largest island in the world. It is also the oldest island in the world. Um, so Madagascar, I'm actually going to get my little pointer going on here. We'll have that. Here's Madagascar, 225 million years ago, jammed inside the supercontinent of Gondwan land. As the continent starts to move apart, Madagascar was dragged away from mainland Africa by India when it was on its collision course with Asia. It smashed in there to form the Himalayas. But Madagascar was dragged away from Africa, but didn't follow. So it became completely isolated off the coast of Africa um, across the Mozambique Channel. There are some species there that have um, remained there um, since that it was part of that supercontinent, but the island has been fantastically enriched by species that arrived since it became isolated. Um, and that has been for the last 65 million years, so since around the time the dinosaurs went extinct. So we are talking about extreme levels of endemism today. Um, as I said, there are some relics of that primitive Gondwana community, so some of the ferns, some of the palms, some primitive reptiles like the boas, they remain there today. Um, but many, many species have arrived since then. We think there might possibly have been a land bridge um, that was there about 40 million years ago that would help some animals cross. Um, there are also many theories about terrestrial species rafting over the Mozambique Channel, which I always struggle to get my head around the idea of a, um, a lima just sitting on a um, bit of vegetation floating across the, the Mozambique Channel, but it helps think in geological timescales. And if something isn't impossible, if enough millions of years pass, then it, it becomes almost likely in the end. So I think that's how some of them made it across. And now we're talking about 90% of the amphibians, 70% of reptiles and plants, all the terrestrial mammals, half the birds, nearly all the insects and spiders are all endemic. So for example, the birds. Madagascar has six endemic or near endemic families. So they are the mesites, the ground rollers, the astes, and the Malagasy warblers. They only occur on the island of Madagascar itself, while the bangers and the cuckoo rollers are found on Madagascar and the neighboring island of Comoros. So um, that's why we call them near endemic. So these are the bangers. Um, they're, I think, many people's favorite endemic family of birds in Madagascar. Top left is the um, sickle billed vanga, also known as the cry baby vanga, because it flies overhead going wah, wah, wah. Um, to the right is the chabot's vanga, real generalist. Um, it, here it's sat in a didieracy um, in the spiny desert, but you can find it in the rainforest as well. And the bottom left is the king of all the vangas, the helmet vanga. It's a beautiful bird with that enormous, fantastic blue bill. It's a tricky one to find. We do have sites, um, we certainly did pre-COVID, um, so it's possible to find them, but you've got to really want to see one and it's a bit of a mission, but um, what a gem if you do. Now, some people liken the, the um, bangers to Darwin's finches, but really they're a much more extreme version of that. And what happened was one single ancestral species arrived on Madagascar, found that there were no other mid-sized insectivorous birds in existence. So it diversified and filled all those niches. And you can see it really has gone to the extremes of those bills. Darwinian finches just doesn't do it justice. Madagascar is home to half of the world's chameleons. Um, so top left, we have the panther chameleon. Um, this is found up in the north of Madagascar, very widespread up there. On the right, the excellently named blue-legged chameleon. And then the bottom left is a tiny, tiny Bruxia tuberculata, one of the littlest of the leaf litter chameleons. You can see there it's just the size of a thumbnail. Um, incredible and incredible how our guides can find them. Again, up in the far north for that one. And for many, it is of course the lemurs that epitomize Madagascar. So there are 106 species of lemur, at least in five extinct, extinct lemur families. Again, all descended from one single ancestral species that arrived in Madagascar after it had become isolated. 
Um, I say at least 106. It changes. Um, the earliest mention of Madagascar that I can find in a Nature Trek brochure um, mentions that there are at least 36 species of lemur. So in the last 30 years, we found quite a few more. And some of that is, is literally finding them, and some of that is genetic um, divisions. Um, so these are all shippikas. Um, their ranges don't overlap. Of the 11 different types of shippika, none of their ranges overlap. So in the left, we have the Deccan's shippika, and the top, the cockerels, and then the bottom is the Perrier's beautiful black shippika in the very far north again of Madagascar. Meanwhile, these are the mouse lemurs. We used to think there was just one species of mouse lemur. Um, then they were split in two. So the one on the left is a brown mouse lemur and the ones on the right are reddish gray mouse lemurs. And we used to think that um, all the wet forest lemurs, mouse lemurs with brown mice lemurs and all the dry forest mouse lemurs with these red, reddish gray ones. Um, now looking at the genetics, there are more than 20 species of mouse lemur. And actually they are very distinct species, um, genetically quite different. The smallest of all primates is found in Madagascar, and that is a mouse lemur. That is Madame Bert's mouse lemur. So for the next 15 minutes, I am going to take you on a little journey across Madagascar. Um, for all of our tours, we fly into Antanarivo, which is here, um, otherwise known as Tana. And then for many of them, not all, but many of them, we go down the one good road in Madagascar, which is the RN7, which is this route. And that's, it's really great that there's one good road that covers this section because it covers some really fantastic habitats in Madagascar. You can just about see on this Google image that there's um, a rain shadow here. So this is the much wetter eastern part of the country where there's lots of rainforest. And this is high plateau that we travel over. And as we go west, it gets drier and drier and warmer. So we go into the deciduous um, dry forest and then we end up on the coast in the spiny desert. Um, so one road and lots of brilliant habitats. Um, also, this is not too bad, this bit of road to Andasabe Mantadia. So we're gonna this evening go Andasabe Mantadia, Ranamafan, Isalo, Ifati. Um, and we'll see how we go. And as we set off on that road, this is the sort of thing we might see. Um, so we know from looking at languages, actually, that the first people arrived in Madagascar around 2,500 years ago. And from those languages, um, we think most likely they came from Borneo and Indonesia. They brought with them their tendency for rice farming, eating rice, um, building Asian style two story houses. Um, and that's why this is quite um, a typical landscape that we might see as we're driving along. We know that also very soon after they arrived, Swahili speaking people arrived from East Africa. Um, and nowadays there are, depending on how you classify them, somewhere between 18 and 21 different cultures. Um, but very broadly, the people who inhabit the wetlands are Asian in cultural ties and architecture. Um, and the people who inhabit the drylands are African in physical, physical appearance and in their tendency to build African style um, huts. And then in terms of accommodation, um, it's not bad. Um, it's OK. It's nothing to write home about, but it's comfortable. Um, it's en suite. Um, it's generally not air con. It's more like you have a fan and a mozzie net, um, but airy rooms, um, decent food. So comfortable place to put your head down at night, basically. And it's worth saying at this point that wildlife viewing in Madagascar is done on foot. So there's no sitting around in safari vehicles here. Um, we're out in the forest every day exploring on our feet. Um, this particular photo is taking the rainforest where some of the um, paths are quite sort of steep at times. So you can see everyone here has got walking poles and they're quite useful and um, help out your knees a bit and keep you steady. Um, you, you need to have a, a relatively good amount of fitness for a trip to Madagascar. You don't need to be, you know, going out for a run to practice every day or anything like that. You just need to be able to, to walk for the morning at a leisurely pace um, or you've got to really want to see a lemur. I think either of those will do really. Uh, so let's get to some of the wildlife. Um, so here in the rainforest, there's some wonderful birding, obviously. Um, this is a Madagascar pygmy kingfisher. Um, it's actually an insectivorous bird, so it's rarely found near water. We're much more likely to find it somewhere in the trees. Um, this is a velvet asti, so that's one of those endemic families that I mentioned at the start. Um, this chap with its beautiful um, green eyeliner. And this chap is a kua. This is a red-fronted kua. Um, the coups are pretty widespread um, around much of central and east of Madagascar. Um, mostly they're ground dwellers. Um, they fill the niche occupied elsewhere by pheasants and by roadrunners. 
Um, the Kuis is an endemic genus and they're part of the cuckoo family. There's, the Kuis themselves are endemic to Madagascar as well. And this beautiful bird is a pitta like ground roller. That is another endemic family that I mentioned. There's a theme here, isn't there? Um, so all but one of the ground rollers live in the rainforests. Um, we'll meet the other one later on. Today. And because I had to put him in, here's that beautiful helmet vanger again. What a beautiful bird. One of the highlights of a trip to um, particularly northern Madagascar is a particularly good place to look for a helmet vanger. And there's lots more um, besides the birding, of course. So I mentioned at the start that half the world's chameleons are found in Madagascar. This one is a Parsons chameleon. It's an arboreal species. It's got a prehensile tail to help it cling into the trees. Um, it walks on, um, walks a bit like, looks like it's a bit like a leaf. Um, some of them have tongues longer than their bodies. They are brilliant to watch. And this chap is a mossy leaf-tailed gecko. Um, let's see if you can see it. So. He is his body, here's his fingers, that's his bottom of his mouth, and there's an eye there. So I will zoom in a little bit. There we go, so there's the fingers again, mouth, and there's the eye. So there's two types of gecko in Madagascar, the ones that look like moss um, or lichen, and the ones that look like dead leaves. And this is the second one. This is um, a satanic leaf-tailed gecko, Europatus fantasticus. This little chap is a giraffe necked weevil. Um, they're fantastic. They're found in a certain type of bush. They're very easy as a tall leader. If you know where the bush is from year to year, then you know where to find your giraffe necked weevils. And this chap is a comet moth. These are huge, sort of like bigger than my face big. Um, fantastic with these long tail streamers, which are so sort of a defensive mechanism. If they're attacked by a bird, the bird's more likely to get the tail streamer and not an important part of the moth. And this is a barren spantella frog, has lots of toxins in its skin. Um, there's well over 300 species of frog, probably countless more than that, but 300 that we know of. Um, you compare that to, to the one native frog in, in the UK. Um, but there's no toads, no newts or no salamanders. They never made it over. This chap's a tenrec. So there's 30 species of tenrec in Madagascar. Again, all descended from one single ancestral species. Um, there's tenrecs that are like otters, like moles, like hedgehogs, like tiny shrews, like little arboreal mice. Um, this one is obviously putting the niche of a hedgehog elsewhere. So this is a lowland street tenrec. And we've come quite a long way through the rainforest without even seeing a lemur. So do not worry, here they are. This is a red-bellied lemur. They're pretty widespread here, really easily seen. And these ones are sexually dimorphic, so you can see that the males have got these white teardrops under their eyes. These, um, they're known as true lemurs, these, these um, in the Lemuridae family. Um, so they're generally on all fours and spring through the trees. This is my personal favorite lemur, the black and white rough lemur. They're a bit more elusive. You have to work for them a bit, but you can often hear them grunting like pigs really far away in the trees. And then you, you're on the right track at that point. Um, very, very beautiful. Quite unusual as they give birth to several young and they live in, live in nests together. They stick together for quite a while. And these are very beautiful shippikas. These are the diadem shippikas that we find in the, the eastern rainforests. And then finally around here, the Indri is likely to be the star of the show. It's the large slimer that still lives today. We know actually that there were three extinct families that were all at least as big, but in today's world, this is the largest that they get. And they live in small family groups and they have an amazing eerie howl that echoes through the forest. So it can be quite incredible just lying in your in your bed in the morning in your lodge and then a mile, two miles away in the forest, you can hear these um, eerie echoing calls of the injury communicating with each other. Now, what we might also spot is this. Not quite so exciting, you say, hmm. So this little hole and what is conspicuously absent from the talk so far is the woodpeckers. And that's because in Madagascar, you don't get woodpeckers, you get this. Aye, aye. Now, disclaimer here, on our, most of our standard tours to Madagascar, you are unlikely to see an aye, aye. They are very difficult to spot because they are very, very nocturnal. So you've got to know where a tree is, where they're living, and be out at midnight and hoping for the best. Um, but we do have a site on our Madagascar Mammals tour um, where they are habituated on little islands. That is your opportunity should you really want to see an aye, aye. And they are incredible. They've got these huge bat ears. They hear the grubs moving through the wood. They've got rodent-like teeth to gnaw at the wood and then that's long skeletal finger to dig them out. There's nothing quite like them. And very occasionally during our searches through the forest, you might get lucky and see a fusa. 
Um, I would say if we run eight tours in a season to Madagascar, one or two you might see a FUSA. So it's not unheard of, um, but you've got to be a bit, a bit lucky as well. Um, it gets easier as you get into November and they teach their mating trees because one female can stay in a mating tree for a long time, receive several gentlemen callers per day. Um, and there's a particular site actually up in the west of the country where um, you've got a really good chance of seeing, seeing a FUSA should you want to. So again, if you want to see a FUSA, we know how to get you there. So we're heading east, um, no we're not, we're heading west across the country now and this is Asala National Park. So we're heading off into the dry deciduous forest. And we have some really lo lovely lodges actually around here. Um, good to dry out of the rainforest, enjoy some good food um, and some beautiful early morning birding around the lodge. So you get up at dawn and head out. It's really dreamy, really easy. This is a Madagascar hoopoo. This is a Madagascar kestrel. These are all birds you might just spot as you wander around. This is a Madagascar paradise flycatcher. Madagascar bulbul. These are all endemics. It's very easy birding in Madagascar. You just find your bird, put Madagascar in front of it, Madagascar magpie robin, and you've got an endemic. This is a forest or Benson's rock thrush. And this is where we're going to come up, catch up with our first wing-tailed lemurs. These are the most social of all the lemur species. They live together in large family groups. They have a dominant female in charge um, and they're just really fun to watch. We tend to go to Madagascar, in fact, we always go to Madagascar um, between September and November. It's a good time for birding, it's a good time for the weather and the lemurs have all had their babies in July and August really. So by September, October, the little baby lemurs are starting to get um, a bit adventurous. They, they cling to their mum's back still, but they'll be starting to explore, learning how to leap around, playing in the trees. So they really are a joy to watch. And you can get some incredibly close encounters as well. So I said we're out on foot um, and we won't ever like, try and get ourselves to, you know, too close to a lemur if they don't look like they want it. But sometimes you can just be sat there um, watching them around and they'll come to you. So you can get some really amazing close views and, and some really nice photos as well. There's also some interesting botany in the Salo. So this is a pacopodium, an elephant's foot plant. Lots of baobabs too, and we'll see more as we move across the country and it gets drier. So there are six endemic species of baobab in Madagascar, and this is Adansonia czar. Now we continue across the country here and there's a place we can stop called Zombitsi Vohibazia National Park. And it's worth stopping if only for this one bird. This is an Apets tetrica, which you will only find in this one fragment of forest in the entire world. So if you want to take it off your list, you've got to stop here. And then finally, we end up on the coast. And it's just, it's a wonderful example of spiny desert around here. There's nothing quite like it. It's a really magical place. And if you get up at dawn, um, go for a walk before it gets too hot. Um, it really is a joy. This is another species of baobab now. This is an Adanzonia ruprostipa. Um, and then lots of these Didieraceae um, sort of octopus trees as well. Um, really incredible habitat. There's a couple of really good birds here as well that will make a special effort to find. Now, this is the other ground roller that I mentioned of that endemic family. So the only one of the five ground rollers that you find, find in the dry forest. This is the long-tailed ground roller. Um, and another important bird that we'll look for around here is a sub-desert mosaic. Again, that's another endemic family. Um, this is another particularly good bird if you're a tall leader because its defense mechanism when it's spotted is to freeze motionless on a branch. So you can send your scout ahead, you can find the mosaic, um, the bird freezes, and you can bring your group in to get a wonderful photo. Job done. And that is about as far as you can go on the good old RN7. Um, this is a departures board at Tuliar Airport. So from the end of the road, um, you need to get on the plane. Now, Air Madagascar is quite a fun airline to travel with. Um, the flights generally go, but they might, well, they won't go at the time you expect them to go. Um, they'll hopefully go the same day, um, but we never quite know what's going to happen. Um, but you as a client on our tours do not need to worry about this. We are there to sort it all out. So usually our guides will have a phone number for their contact at Air Madagascar. They'll give them a call, check if it's worth going to the airport or not. Um, you will get you around in the end, but um, it's, it's quite good to take as few internal flights as possible. But if you want to get some really great habitats around the country, then you need to fly. So it's worth doing. <laughs>